I'm showing it's about 10 o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thanks to everybody for joining us. Um, first, I'd like to give a shout out to the folks at Zoom. Um, we're expecting a few over, a little over 500 people for the webinar today. Uh, we actually had about 540 on one yesterday and um, reported that there weren't any glitches. So knock on wood, um, uh, it seems like it's working pretty well and um, I, I'm favorably impressed. So um, thanks for joining us today. Um, um, my name is Jason Sharp. I'm a tax shareholder uh, here at Briggs um, and have worked with a team of folks to try and bring you this information. Um, as I'm sure you guys know, this is incredibly fluid, changing uh, literally by the day. Um, this is a little unprecedented for us because typically when we get, you know, tax legislation, we have weeks or months to sort of try and figure it out. And the government agencies usually send out additional guidance and, um, you know, time is a little bit on our side. Um, in fact, when the TCJA came out at the end of 17, we were all complaining because we only had a couple of months to look at it before it went into effect and uh, what we wouldn't give for a couple of months right now. So I would tell you there is probably still a lot of questions that are unanswered. Um, detail guidance um, is supposed to be coming um, and, and certainly whenever we hear anything, we will try and get that information out to you. Um, but uh, it, it, I do understand it's frustrating for a lot of people because there are some what appear to be very basic questions that are yet to be unanswered. So um, we're kind of like you waiting on uh, uh, whatever information is out there. Um, for purposes of today's uh, webinar, we do have a Q&A panel. You can ask questions. I would say, uh, please be mindful though, if we've got 500 people here, um, and everybody asks a question or two, um, it's gonna be a little overwhelming. So um, we will try and respond to the questions as best we can. Um, and if you have one, go ahead and send it in. Um, Rick Westerfield, who's a fellow tax shareholder, is uh, manning the phones to answer those questions as best we can. If we don't get you an immediate answer, we'll try and respond uh, maybe after the presentation. Today's slides are also gonna be made available to everyone here on the webinar. We will be sending out a link so that you can get um, a, a copy of these slides. And we are actually also recording this presentation. So um, you could actually listen to it again if you want or, or share with somebody. Um, another thing I would say about this, so we've had several clients comment on it and is be careful about misinformation. I think we're all, um, very anxious to try and learn as much as we can. And, uh, you know, Google is our friend. Um, and I, I think there's, uh, we have run across um, incorrect information being out there. Um, I don't think it's necessarily nefarious or anything. I think people are just scrambling. Um, and, and so do be a little careful of, of what you find and what the source is uh, from where you're reading it. Also, um, the Texas Society of CPAs, I think had, um, um, Another warning to, uh, they are uh, being put on high alert as is the Treasury Department for scams. Um, Small Business Association administration is not gonna call anyone and ask for information to give you a loan. The IRS is not gonna call you and ask you for social security numbers and all that stuff. So um, just please be very mindful. They, they are expecting there to be increased um, scam activity um, as a result of this. So uh, just kind of a little PSA there. So uh, we're going to go ahead and get started with the slides um, and go through our presentation. And, and I want to sort of talk about the structure because um, this is going to be a little bit different. So what Washington has done is they've really provided uh, what they've called three phases to, um, to respond to this pandemic. Um, and, and, and the idea for this is to, um, to try and let people hold on to cash as best they can, try and maintain payroll and workers um, uh, to keep people employed and to keep things going. So, you know, that sort of is the over, overreaching thing. And so the first thing they did, um, oh, let, let me just back up and say, wh what we're gonna do is the majority of the questions we're getting from our clients um, is really about the SBA loan program 
which was part of the CARES Act, which was in, uh, on this slide, what, what was in phase three. So what we're gonna do is, th this talks about the three phases they did where they, they extended some deadlines, um, then they came out with the Family First Coronavirus uh, Response Act on March 18th, and then last Friday, uh, the CARES Act. But we're gonna jump right into, sort of take these out of order, um, we're gonna jump right into the SBA loans um, portion of the CARES Act, uh, talk about that first, um, and then um, to make sure we have plenty of time to cover all that information, and then we will jump back and sort of touch on the, the tax and, and related provisions um, uh, for these other three phases afterwards. So um, as a point of introduction, um, I'm joined today by a couple of my colleagues, Kevin and Eric, um, they are going to um, handle the discussion on the SBA loan process. And uh, so, gentlemen, take it away. Great. Thanks, Jason. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Appreciate everyone joining. This is Eric Deal. I'm with the BNV Capital Advisors Group. We're the investment banking subsidiary of Briggs and Veselka. And uh, just for a brief introduction, prior to my time here at Briggs, I was a commercial lender here in Houston for about eight years or so. Um, fortunately or, or unfortunately, I guess, depending on how you look at it, I was never an SBA lender, but uh, was fortunate enough to have some exposure to this process, um, which today is really doesn't count for anything because the entire SBA world has been really turned on its head. Um, we hope that's a temporary stay and, and things return to normal soon, but certainly um, there's a lot of discussion going on on these new programs. So our goal today uh, to provide a very high level overview of what we know today about the CARES Act, uh, keeping in mind that this is a very fluid situation. Um, some of the policies and guidance has even yet to be written. So we're, we're keeping up with it as, as best as we can, uh, much like you guys. Um, there, how we've organized it is, is basically three main programs that make up the CARES Act. The first two are what I would refer to as new money programs. Um, and that's probably where uh, discussion will be focused here today. The first program, the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, is designed to assist companies in keeping their workforce employed throughout the crisis. Um, if, and if the loan is used ultimately for its intended purposes, can be 100% forgivable. And this is the newest, um, latest and greatest from the SBA. The second program, the uh, Economic Injury Disaster Loans, uh, these are usually available or at, to at least some extent during natural disasters. So um, for us in Houston, you know, uh, Harvey, there was there were similar programs for disaster loans. This specific one is a little bit different in that businesses can apply for the first 10,000 and expect to receive it in about three business days. Um, and if that 10K is received, it never has to be paid back. It essentially turns into a grant even if a subsequent loan, disaster loan is applied for and not approved, businesses get that 10,000 automatically. So that's the main difference that we see in compared to historical disaster loans. Finally, the third program there is the S Small Business Debt Relief Program. This is probably the most straightforward. Um, and this is where the SBA has said that they would pay all principal interest and fees for the next six months for any current SBA loans and any SBA loans booked in the, I think it's over the next eight weeks. So it's, it's essentially a, a loan payment waiver. It's not a deferral. The SBA has just said, we will cover your loan payments for um, SBA 7A, 504, and for micro loans. So pretty much all of their products. And um, our understanding today is that you are able to, or businesses are able to participate in all three programs if certain conditions are met. Um, and the main condition being that the use of proceeds not be used for the same purposes. Um, so the spirit of this is really to help small businesses navigate this, this crisis and to provide as much funding as, as possible. So Jason, wanna hit the next slide? So here's a quick comparison between the two new money loan programs. So both of these programs provide businesses with new loans to help maintain operations through the crisis. The Paycheck Protection Program, slightly more restrictive on the use of funds, which are limited to payroll expenses, employee salaries, mortgage interest, rent, and utilities. Um, whereas the, the disaster loans or the EIDLs are a bit more flexible 
and what you can use those for. Uh, they can be used for accounts payable and other types of operating expenses. So it's a little bit more open-ended on the on the allowed use there. The amount covered we'll dive to in a little we'll dive into a little deeper later. Uh, but the Paycheck Protection Program allows companies to borrow two and a half times of their average monthly payroll costs with a cap of 10 million while the EIDLs are capped at 2 million. And the EDIL loan amount is calculated based on the actual, um, what they call the actual injured amount. And so there's there's a little bit more that goes into actually calculating what, what a business would qualify for. Interest rates are comparable on both of these, three and a half percent and four. Uh, the forgiveness here is the big differentiator. The PPP offers full or partial loan forgiveness for businesses that use funds for their intended purposes, which is to keep staff employed throughout the crisis. Um, we'll also discuss how we can assist companies through this process. Um, in fact, one of our partners has had a direct experience in applying for these SBA loans. And so, you know, we've got direct feedback um, and certainly we've had clients going through the process as well. Um, it's, it's been pretty fast and furious. A quick note on the applications. We had a, a lengthy discussion internally about this yesterday. The guidance we've received from the Department of Treasury indicates that PPP applications are, into, are anticipated to open this Friday, April 3rd. Um, in contrast, the EDIL loans, the application is live. There's a link on the SBA website, and that should be, um, I think there's a link later in this, um, in this presentation, and certainly we'll make that available on our website as well if it's not already up there. But this is, like I said, fast and furious, and um, you know, it's being rolled out as quickly as possible. Next slide, Jason. So to put this in per into a little bit perspective, in 2019, the SBA funded approximately 28 billion in SBA loans over the course of the entire 2019 year. With the CARES Act, we're looking at an authorized 350 billion in loans just over the next couple of months. So that number to me is staggering. We're talking about a 13 times increase in the dollars funded in about a quarter of the time. And so it's pretty safe to say that the SBA is gonna be absolutely inundated over the coming weeks and months. Um, there is discussions about opening up other banks and other financial institutions to accept SBA applications to help the, uh, the surge in, in what's to come. But that's why we're here. Um, we're here to share what we know about the resources that are available and how we can help, help businesses through this process. Next slide, Jason. For eligible applicants, this is really slated towards small businesses and nonprofits with fewer than 500 employees uh, that are required to be in operation as of February 15th of this year. And it is also open to individuals um, who operate as a sole proprietorship or an independent contractor and those who are self-employed as well. And uh, it also includes tribal businesses um, or business concerns that meet the SBA size standard. One caveat to this um, and something that we've been you know, discussing internally as well and that we're still trying to understand um, completely is that uh, companies with some form of institutional capital sponsorship, whether that be from a private equity group or a venture capital firm or some other type of similar backing, based on the conversations we've had um, with, with those types of groups, um, those companies, it will be a little bit more challenging for them to obtain funding. Um, we've had several conversations with private equity groups and, and several of them aren't even planning to apply. So I, I guess what I would say there is if for anyone here who who does have some sort of institutional capital, certainly follow up with with your capital providers to see what their what their plan of action is. But tr from a traditional standpoint, the SBA is not catered towards those those types of companies with with sponsorship. But we, there are certain exceptions. Um, I think it's more for companies that are have a more of a franchise model. Um, and there's a couple other exceptions as well, but we're hoping to get more guidance from the SBA on this soon. Next slide, Jason. All right, as it pertains to the PPP, um, acceptable uses of proceeds, like I mentioned earlier, are, are pretty direct. The language in the 800 plus page act goes into much more detail as you can imagine, but the theme here is the proceeds are designed to cover payroll and healthcare costs for employees rent, utilities, and some forms of interest. 
So the important element to remember here is how this ties back to loan forgiveness, which we'll go into detail later. The proceeds from the PPP loan must be specifically used for these categories in order to qualify for loan forgiveness. Um, so, so we'll expand on that here in the next couple of slides. Jason, if you want to move forward. The maximum loan amount, um, it's a little wordy slide, but essentially the message here is that the maximum amount is the lesser of two and a half times monthly payroll cost during the one year period before the loan is made. So looking back over a 12, trailing 12 month period, or the loan is capped at 10 million. Um, there's a US Chamber of Commerce hand, handout that illustrates this, but in kind of looking at this, this formula here, you basically take the sum of included payroll costs, mostly salaries, wages, vacation, healthcare benefits, retirement benefits, subtract the excluded costs, which are listed there, some form uh, payroll taxes, retirement taxes, um, qualified sick leave that may qualify under the Family First Coronavirus Response Act, with I, which I think Jason may cover a little bit more detail. And that ultimately arrives at your actual payroll cost. And from that, that net payroll cost, is what the loan amount is calculated on. And it's, it's two and a half times that, that ending number. So one of our partners did a back of the envelope cap calculation, um, was able to estimate that approximately that 10 million cap is what a business with about 500 employees salaried at just under 100K would potentially qualify for. So again, that's a very, very rough estimate and a lot more goes into it. But the spirit of the policy again, is to reserve this program for companies with fewer than 500 employees and for most small businesses that do qualify, that cap we don't anticipate hopefully being a major issue. Next slide, Jason. Okay, so for the loan forgiveness, um, again, in looking at the, the purpose of this to cover two months of employee uh, rent and utility costs, if businesses use the funds as attended, then the loan should be eligible for 100% forgiveness. How this will work is something that we're still exploring ourselves, but we anticipate the SBA to put out some additional guidance here, but um, our anticipation is that forgiveness will involve some sort of application where businesses will demonstrate that they use the funds for their intended purposes. Um, to that end, it's equally as important for all businesses to document very clearly um, how they're using the proceeds and to basically prove out that they're using them for their intended purposes. The expense tracking is something um, as a firm that we're pretty well equipped to do. Um, Jason, you may correct me if I'm wrong here, but we expect the, the process of applying for forgiveness to be not unlike filing a tax return in that you would gather the required expense documentation, potentially attach it to an application and send it to the SBA for ultimate um, you know, approval and, and ultimate forgiveness. In my experience, the SBA is notorious for kind of having that check the box mentality where if one thing is out of place, it could be reverted back. So again, that goes back to the detailed um, record keeping that would be important throughout this process. The forgiveness is not necessarily all or none. The amount forgiven could be adjusted uh, down if payroll costs are found to be lower than what they should have been. And there's also a couple of um, forgiveness reduction um, elements that we'll cover here in the next couple of slides. If you want to move forward, Jason. So here, here's a very high level example of how we anticipate this to work. In scenario one, you have a company that qualifies to take the full two and a half times payroll of 250,000. However, over the next two months, the qualified costs of payroll, rent, and interest are less than the actual loan amount. So in this case, the company borrowed more than, than what their costs ultimately became. So in that case, the balance would need to be repaid over a 10-year amortization schedule, that 24,000. Um, and so that's kind of the scenario one. Scenario two is essentially a break-even point uh, where qualified costs equal the loan amount, so no additional amount is owed. In scenario three, this illustrates where a company took the max loan they could, two and a half times payroll. However, their monthly costs wound up exceeding what they borrowed under the PPP. So a company cannot be forgiven for more than they borrowed. So while the PPP certainly helps in this scenario, it did not cover all the qualified costs. And that's in this type of scenario, and it's important to remember the other two SBA programs as well, the disaster loans and the uh, the debt relief. 
So, um, you know, we're trying to look at this holistically as possible, but this specific example pertains to the PPP. So the actual calculations here are done will be way much more complex. And this is something that we're working on internally and in developing kind of a model to help businesses um, A, identify what their payroll costs are to figure out what they're qualified for, and B, looking ahead, what forecasting what that forgiveness loan amount um, will ultimately be. So if you go to the next slide, Jason, we'll kind of get into the forgiveness adjustments. There's two adjustments that can be made. The first adjustment covers any reduction in the number of employees. So remember that the payroll cost and what the loan amount is based off is that first gray box there. That is the net payroll cost we calculated a couple of slides ago, um, which is calculated on, the, on a trailing 12 month basis. If average FTEs decrease during the first eight weeks that that loan is originated, then the forgiveness amount would be reduced, mainly since the purpose of this loan is to keep those FTEs constant and, and avoid having any reduction, um, at least throughout this crisis. If there is a reduction in FTEs, businesses have the option on how to calculate the forgiveness. So option one, you take the average FTE per month um, for the comparable period last year in 2019, or option two, you take the average FTE per month for the first two months of this year. So again, there, there is more that goes into this. This is meant to be kind of a high level illustration. Um, and we're working on templates to, to kind of detail some of the, the nuances of these calculations. The second adjustment um, is based on the wages paid to employees. This is a little bit more of a direct approach where the forgiveness amount is reduced by the amount of pay cuts exceeding 25% of employees earning less than 100,000 per year. So again, the, the whole spirit of this policy is to keep employees not only employed, but at close to the levels of where they are now. So any, any payroll reduction in excess of 25% during this period would cause a reduction in the ultimate forgiveness amount. So lastly, for me, Jason, if you wanna move forward on the slide, a uh, couple other PPP highlights. Fully guaranteed by the guests, by the U.S. government, um, so there's really zero risk for banks um, that are processing these loans. Personal guarantees are not required, and these are unsecured. No, no collateral is required as well, and we anticipate this to really streamline the application process. In my personal experience, a lot of the, um, for anyone who's dealt with the SBA before, it can be an onerous process, and uh, a lot of the times these applications do get bogged down for those two specific the, the personal guarantee and collateral. So that should help streamline the, the application process. These are low interest rate loans. None will exceed 4%, no prepayment penalties. Um, and one thing to highlight too, the inclusion of nonprofits in this program is pretty significant. While nonprofits are, are normally allowed to apply for disaster loans uh, during a natural disaster, so certainly for the hurricanes here that we've experienced, I don't believe that we've seen nonprofits being opened up to the SBA to this degree. Um, and I believe we have an, a, a follow-up webinar that will focus more specifically on nonprofits. Um, so look for that in our, on our website as well. We're, we're definitely staying on top of that. Uh, so with that, Kevin, I'll let you take over and kind of discuss the next two programs. Very good. Thank you so much. This is Kevin Stewart. I'm a, an advisory principal and I currently lead the uh, client accounting services practice, uh, where we serve as outsource controllership for, for many companies in Houston. Um, but, but with that, these economic injury disaster loans have been around for several years, uh, although this is the first time a uh, pandemic has been considered a disaster to be applied. It always before it's been more hurricane or tornado related to kind of service. And so e EIDLs are low interest loans that are required to be paid back, as, as Eric mentioned, that they're not forgivable up to $2 million of principal and interest. Uh, the component to this that's changed slightly is, excuse me, the change that was changed slightly is the emergency grant piece of it. And so applicants can go out to the website on the SBA, which we'll provide the link shortly, that you can go to and the application truly takes 10 to 15 minutes, at least the initial piece of it. And as a portion of that on the last slide, it, it asks for banking information to, to request a $10,000 emergency loan. Now the timing of that theoretically, again, for the SBA website is that it's paid, the decision is made and paid within three days. 
And so if you apply today, theoretically, that decision would be made by three days from now and potentially paid out to you at that point in time. Excuse me. Now, when you apply for the EIDL loan and, and, and if they pay the $10,000 to you, there, there's a second component to you and they will reach back out to you within, uh, it could be a period of between three to seven days where they, they reach out to you to request additional information. So with the economic injury loan, there truly has to have been an injury occurred as of that point in time. So it's not projected, it's not assumed in the future, it truly is an economic injury has occurred because your business has been disrupted because of the pandemic. And so that, that's been a little bit undefined as far as what that is, but I would assume there'd be some sort of justification as far as these are the revenues last year's, these are the revenues two months ago, and this has been the specific impact on our business within the last month or, or whatever the time period is that you began to be impacted. Uh, so unlike the traditional loans of the past, the CARES waives the requirement that you could, they're unable to obtain credit elsewhere, which would allow you to apply even if you have access to a credit line. Um, so that, that is, that is a, a big benefit. Jason, next slide, please. So a little bit of key differences between the PPP and the EIDL is, is as we've mentioned a few times now, is the EIDL is, is, is non-forgivable. So they are low interest. Uh, and some information I was looking at today it was as, as low as 0.5%, but they're up to 30 years uh, with loan scheduled P&I payments, whereas PPPs are forgivable. You can, uh, take an EIDL and, and effectively, um, <laughs> oh, re refinance it through a PPP instead, right? So you can take that, get it, refinance it as a PPP. So the grant is never has to be repaid, uh, which is a benefit. There is no automatic grant with the PPP, although that EIDL can roll into and effectively re reduce the funds of your PPP if you end up getting one. Uh, the application process, there is the link there to the EIDL. Uh, within that uh, application process, the, it does allow you to uh, request a $10,000 emergency grant. Um, and so you're applying directly to the SBA website, through the SBA website, unlike PPPs where you're going through an SBA lender. Uh, they are opening that up pretty significantly. They do have preferred SBA lenders, but they're opening up significantly to others. And as Eric mentioned, that application process for PPPs is, I believe this this Friday, is the anticipation. And then separately, the EIDL is, is, as of right now, you can go out and apply for it. Next slide, Jason. So the Small Business Debt Relief Program, and I think Eric actually covered this pretty well, um, and even though we just have one slide here, but effectively the application is to uh, eliminate your principal and interest payments for the next six months, you know, and upon the signing of that bill, which was last Friday, I believe. Next slide. So in tying it all together, you know, which program is right for your business? And maybe, it, maybe it's all three. There, there's nothing pre that precludes you from applying for both protection or assistance under the uh, EIDL with the emergency grant or the PPP or even the small business debt relief program. Now, the exception there is if you're applying for each or if you're getting benefits from each, they cannot be applied to the exact same expenses, meaning that if you are trying to use the PPP to cover expenses, payroll expenses specifically for the period of, uh, March 1st through March 31st, uh, you would you would not be able to find uh, get financing or assistance for that same time period from another program. However, you could use financing for a different time period. And so, if if you got protection under one for the for the period of March, you could apply for assistance for the period of April, and then kind of get it back. But they just cannot be used for the exact same expenses. So so no double dipping effectively. Um, very good. So the anticipated, flipping back and forth here. So next slide, Jason. Sorry about that. No worries. So the anticipated app application app information, and there is, so the, the SBA emergency loan is, is out there already that you can go to and apply, and it truly is about a 10 minute process initially. Uh, with secondarily, it, with, there will be some additional information requested for you to, to get additional funding uh, beyond the grant. However, so, so on the anticipated application information for the PPP, there, and I believe we'll provide some links, the application draft came out yesterday and you can, you can find it on the either U.S. Department of Treasury or also the Small Business Administration websites. And, and truly what's requiring is, in, in both of them really, it's, it's, it's a certification that, that you have been impacted, that your business has been drastically impacted by uh, the COVID-19 emergency. 
Uh, and then separately, the funds within the PPP are going to be used to retain workers, maintain payroll, et cetera. Uh, the applicant doesn't have, have any other applications pending under this program for the same purpose. So the time period is, is February 15th going forward. And the little bit more detailed information on the next slide is because the PPP is, is truly more from the, from a, from the ability to get a loan and the number, the, the, the amount of the loan is based completely on payroll, then it's going to be very, very influenced by your payroll information. And so some of the information will be need to be received and obtained to either to both calculate your payroll to provide support to the lender about your payroll, then a lot of it's going to be payroll specific information. And so from our, our basic understanding at this point in time, and there's a little bit of a variance in, in the, the law versus what's being asked for, but effectively, we're looking for payroll information for 2019 and possibly up through January 31st, up, up through March 31st. But it's that it's a historical payroll information. Uh, one of the things we didn't mention, I don't believe, is around the $100,000. And so, pay for for salaries that exceed $100,000. Our understanding currently, our interpretation of the law is that payroll for an individual can be covered up to $100,000 in the calculation but not above that. So at 101,000, that next thousand would not be covered or be included in the wages. Again, there's room for debate there, but I think that's a pretty conservative approach to it in, is our understanding. Other information, unemployment insurance, you know, 1099s and how that impacts it as far as independent contractors and how they potentially get included in wages and, and how that's defined. And there's a little bit of subject, subjectivity there that we, we had a pretty hearty conversation on yesterday internally. Uh, certain termination dates, the number of employees, you know, health expenses, empl both employee and employer, uh, and again, projected payroll costs for the next eight weeks that you're, you're seeking coverage for. And then when you get into the reimbursement side of it and potential uh, reduction or forgiveness of your fees, it kind of comes to what did you actually spend the money on? You know, and, and there's a tracking component to it that, that, that we're going to cover a little bit in the next slides around rent expense and utility expense and, and, and et cetera. So, uh, although the, the, the application is relatively straightforward, there is a little bit of complexity when it comes to defining what, what payroll is and, and coming to it. Next slide, Jason. So, so how can BNV help? And, and I think we can help in several different ways, you know, but from a documentation gathering and help you assess and understand what's being included in payroll, we can help create, uh, we can gather that information for you through a virtual data room. Uh, to manage the flow of documentation to the banks uh, that you're that you're trying to work with, it's helping to identify the payroll cost and the uh, and, and the forgiveness forecasting. So there is a bookkeeping slash accounting purpose to that, where my team does that on a daily basis for clients, just maintaining the books, right? And so when it comes to tracking these expenses, is how do you segregate that payroll that's being captured? How do you segregate those expenses that you're paying the money on? And maybe it'd be wise to create a separate bank account to track this so it's a little bit more simplistic. Again, we can help you assess and understand those things that you need to do. The ongoing expense monitoring, we, we've kind of captured it here a little bit, but I, I, would, I would say a little bit of word of warning in the sense that you've got $349, $350 billion, which sounds like a tremendous amount of money, and it is. Uh, but we've had probably 1,000 people that we've talked to in the last two days on these webcasts. Um, and, and that's just Houston. So if you take that across the nation, if 34,000 companies apply for it, then we're talking about a $10,000 grant. So this, this isn't a savior. It's just, it, it's a tool in the tool belt that you should apply for and use and, and hope for the best in your But other plans should be kind of taken into account as well. And so from that perspective, we can help you, uh, from a CAS perspective, help you assess your forecast, help you determine some plans, develop some processes, and kind of think through what's the best thing for your business in addition to helping you kind of get the funding uh, through these process, through these two different, excuse me, at these three different processes through the SBA. Next slide, please. So the other, the other components here is helping you with the application, you know, preparing for forgiveness and that there probably, there will be a little bit more, I think there's probably more complexity in that, frankly, than the application process itself to, to get the funding necessarily. Uh, and it's guidance to the SBA process. You know, we've, we've probably received like, a hundred more questions in the last few days from clients and just trying to understand, you know, what's the best thing for them? How do they apply? How do they do? Where do they get this information? And so I would encourage you to reach out to, and we, we have, excuse me, an SBA task force website, but as I believe most of you on this call are clients, reach out directly to your primary service provider to you. So reach out to that manager, that partner, 
start having that conversation. And if we need to funnel it through kind of this, the, we'll call it the expert group, the SBA task force, then we can do that. But I would encourage you to, as you have questions, to specifically reach out to the person that you, that you interact with on a regular basis at BNV. So some good sources of information that, that we've pulled for this webcast and, and trying to connect with clients is on the U.S. Senate Committee on Small Business and Entrepreneurship Reference Guide. And so there's, there's a link there. And when we send this, 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 uh, uh, this PowerPoint presentation out, this PDF out, there is a link there that you can kind of go to. But you can also just Google search that. A lot of tremendous information. And then as Jason mentioned, there is a lot of conflicting information out there. And so to the extent that you can go straight to the horse's mouth, uh, going to the treasury site, going to the SBA site, you know, both of those are fantastic places to go to to get the best information. Uh, and on, on the application for the SBA funding or for the PPP funding, uh, within the, uh, the information section of that, you know, kind of describing the process, describing the application, there is also a lot of good information of what defines payroll, the time period, and those types of things well. But all that is a draft and it's subject to change. And so we just need to be aware of that too. It's just a very fluid process. Next slide, Jason. So the last thing here is one, one last way we can, assist, we can assist is BNV is very well connected, you know, we, through bankers, regulators, attorneys, and more through our, our legacy of loyalty in the last uh, couple of, uh, of decades that we've been in operation, we, we have built a very strong network of partners that we interact with on a regular basis. So if we're not able to answer a question as, as you need assistance, if that means it's through a banking relationship, through a regulator, through an attorney, then we are happy to help make that connection, um, make that connection to, to assist you in the process. Uh, this is all just a, a unexpected time and a great, uh, frankly, a great learning experience for our kids. And yet um, we're all in this together, right? Because we're all striving to get, we're all trying to survive together and kind of do this to the best of our ability. So the extent that we can assist you and connect you, we are happy to do that. And so with that, I'm going to hand it over to, to my, my good friend, Jason. All right. So now we'll move on to the sexy tax um, topics that I'm sure everyone is, has just eagerly been awaiting, right? Um, I already feel like we're having a good webinar. There clearly have not been any squirrels in my yard or you guys would have been hearing um, my four-legged squirrel detection system going off. So we, we've, uh, we've been, been very fortunate. Um, just want to spend the last bit of time, be, be mindful of, uh, of our schedule here, but I did want to just touch on some of the tax provisions that have come out. So again, the first thing we got um, about a month ago was the time extension on um, on filing returns. Um, there's actually a, uh, a good FAQ that is linked here. Um, the IRS release, they also had a notice 20, 2018. It's, it's a bit of a dry read, but the FAQ page is, is a good one um, to exactly spell out what returns and filings have been postponed and also what payments have been postponed. Um, basically, you can think of it as anything um, oh, and, and, and this extension applies to everyone. You don't have to, uh, to fill out a form or anything. It's, it's, it's an automatic extension for all applicable taxpayers. But do keep in mind, it, it is a limited extension. So this extension is only going to apply to income tax filings uh, that were due on April 15th. Uh, so the, the big ones are going to be uh, 1040s, individual returns, 1120s, corporate returns, and then the first quarter estimated tax payments that are April 15th. So all of those got pushed to July 15th. Um, what makes this a little unusual is we're all sadly familiar with storm extensions. And, and the way those usually work is if, if the extension is, in this case, July 15th, typically anything due between today and July 15th can be done on July 15th. That is not the case with this extension. This extension is very narrow and specific. So it's only for filings on April 15th. So anything, uh, so for example, second quarter ES payments that are due June 15th, um, the treasury has specifically said those are still due June 15th. Those do not get a postponement. Also tax filings for May 15th are still due May 15th. So this was specifically an extension of taxes owed and um, forms to be filed strictly on April 15th. So, um, yeah, I think that's just kind of um, some additional information. Oh, and it, it does not apply to payroll taxes or excise taxes. It's strictly income taxes. 
Um, the second phase we got, which was uh, passed, uh, I believe, on March 18th, is the FFCRA, Family First Coronavirus Response Act. This is basically um, set up for companies that maybe don't offer um, very much to employees in the terms of medical leave or sick leave. Um, th this is a way uh, for companies to, to pay their employees for these types of leave um, and then get a dollar for dollar credit against um, payroll taxes. So, so basically um, they can pay the employees to take this leave um, but they're, they're not actually having to incur the cost. The government is basically paying it in the, in the form of lost payroll taxes. So um, the DOL, uh, and we have a link down here, they actually have a very good uh, FAQ page that they've been updating on a daily basis with, um, so, you know, sometimes uh, our government is, is maybe not the best resource, um, but for, for what I have seen, this is actually a very good one. It has questions that you probably do want to know the answers to. So I would, um, I would urge you to, to go there um, and look at their questions. I think they're up to almost 60 questions now that they've answered that I would say are the very common ones. Um, and they've been updating them, um, like I said, almost on a daily basis. Um, they did come out and announce the effective date uh, of this is today. Um, there was some confusion around that. Some people thought it was April 2nd. It is actually April 1st. Um, DOL announced that. So the way it works is there's basically sort of two main provisions, and then those provisions will lead into tax credits potentially. So the first provision is family and medical leave. So this sort of describes uh, that. Um, so basically, this is applying to employer, employers with less than 500 employees. Um, for that purpose, you do count full, part-time, temps, anyone on leave. Uh, it does exclude independent contractors. So that should help you uh, with that definition. Um, the way it works is if, if a person has to take leave because um, a child um, um, has no, the school's been closed, which I think is the case for just about everybody here who has a child uh, or just childcare is unavailable. Um, they can take, um, they're, and, and they're unable to work um, or telework. And, and again, the DOL has good definitions of exactly what is telework. Um, then, um, then you can, and, and we'll get into the dollars here on, on another slide. Um, it's up to $200 a day for 50 days. I, I do want to point out um, that if you're a small business with fewer than 50 employees, this may not, uh, you may not be forced to do this. Um, um, if you have fewer than 50 employees um, and, you know, that the employees' schools or uh, children's schools are closed, um, if, if you can, can say that, you know, paying this leave and, and complying with this law would jeopardize the viability of the of the going concern of the business, and that is the exact language in the statute, um, then you do not have to um, ad adhere to it. Um, and if you're wondering what jeopardize the viability of the business is, again, on this DOL FAQ page, they list out, it, th these are the factors that they're looking at. So if this applies to you, and you, uh, if these factors here apply to you, and you have fewer than 50 employees, um, then you may not be required to do this. Um, so here's sort of the, the calculation. So the first 10 days of leave uh, can be unpaid. Um, you can also have employees use any existing accrued vacation, sick or personal leave. Um, but then after that, um, you have to pay no less than two thirds of their regular pay rate, uh, but it is capped at $200 a day. It's also capped at 50 days. So that's how you get to the $10,000 in the aggregate amount. Um, you, there is also a job restoration provision. Um, so employees who take the emergency leave are entitled to be restored to an equivalent position um, when they return. Um, there are some special exceptions to the job restoration if you have fewer than 25 employees. Uh, a lot of these provisions are pretty similar to the traditional FMLA uh, provisions that some of you may be familiar with. Um, again, as I said, I am a tax person, um, not an employment law. So uh, specific questions, definitely go to the DOL website or, or consult your, your attorneys. Uh, they can probably provide better information and, or HR resources. 
Um, the second provision here um, within the FFCRA is uh, the emergency paid sick time. So um, this again is for employers with uh, fewer than 500 employees. So you, you have to provide 80 hours of paid sick time. And there's even some provisions for part-time workers as well. Um, the way this works is there's actually six reasons um, that, that, that they've come up with as to why you might be missing work. Um, it, the, the first three are, are sort of what I would consider you're directly impacted by COVID-19. So that's someone who is specifically and has been medically required to be quarantined um, or they've, um, they believe they have uh, COVID-19, they have the, the symptoms, seeking a diagnosis, um, then there you get compensated at your regular rate up to $511 a day. Um, the, the, the other three sick time provisions are what I sort of think of as more a little more indirect, you're indirectly impacted. So you don't necessarily have the disease or you haven't been forced into quarantine, but, um, but you're having to care for somebody, the school is closed, that type of thing. Um, then again, you can take two thirds of your regular rate, but, but if it's one of those reasons, it's capped at the $200 a day for 10 days. So again, that's a little more um, similar to the, to, the, to the regular leave that we just talked about. So the way the tax credits work, um, you're gonna get payroll tax credit. If you're the employer, you're gonna get payroll tax credits um, for the amounts that you're paying under either of these programs. Um, so uh, the credits, um, you get those directly. I, I have not seen practical examples of how the math is going to work on this. Um, hopefully we'll get um, some, some better guidance from the DOL, um, but it's, in, it's intended to be a dollar for dollar credit on, uh, on the money you spend here uh, will we'll offset payroll tax credits. Um, Again, I think we've touched on everything here. Oh, I, third bullet point, qualified health plan expenses are, um, that are incurred are also included in the, in the tax credit portion. So it's the dollar for dollar wages on the sick leave, dollar for dollar on the medical leave, and then the, um, and then the healthcare cost, health plan costs. Um, the credits are going to be refundable. Um, there's a couple of exceptions um, if, if you're already getting credits under the 45S uh, plans, then it, they may not uh, work here. Uh, that's a pretty narrow exception, but just be aware of that. Um, the statute says that this is also going to apply to self-employed individuals. Um, I haven't seen, again, mechanically how that's going to work since self-employeds don't really file quarterly payroll and pay taxes. They do it through estimated tax payments. Um, and with their filing of the 1040. So I'm not sure exactly how this is gonna work, but do be aware that uh, it's intended that self-employed individuals can take a benefit from this as well. So um, in the remaining time here, and I, I certainly wanna be mindful of everyone's time, we got about 10 minutes left. Um, the CARES Act really had two main areas, the, the SBA loan program that, that Kevin and Eric talked um, a great deal about that's gotten so much attention. But there are also a, a, a number of, uh, of tax provisions. And again, the CARES Act is designed to um, let people hold on to cash. Cash is king. So um, most of these provisions are, um, are, are taxpayer friendly and they are allowing for additional deferral of um, either, either granting additional deductions to minimize tax but the majority of them are more of a deferral. Um, so it's, 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 it's giving you better, uh, better book tax timing differences uh, to help you hold on to cash a little bit longer. Um, one thing that's gotten a lot of press obviously are the rebate checks. Um, uh, I think a lot of folks are pretty familiar with how this works, but um, it's $1,200 per person, $500 for each qualifying child. Um, there is a limitation on it and a phase out so for married filing joint, um, once the uh, adjusted gross income is at 150,000, then you begin getting phased out. Um, and if the AGI reaches 198, then that, that's the point at which you will be completely phased out of the rebate. So if you make 160,000 on a married return, you'd still get a rebate. You just wouldn't get the full amount mentioned here at the top. Um, these rebate checks are gonna be based on 20, 
2019 tax returns. If you haven't filed your 2019 tax return yet, um, then they will be based on 2018. Um, the way the statute is written, is there actually a refundable credit against 2020 taxes? So to the extent that your rebate is based on 2018, but then you file your 2019 return in a few months and that would have actually given you a better answer. Uh, our understanding is there will be a mechanism in place for you to get um, the difference, um, but we haven't seen exactly how that's supposed to work, but I believe that is the intent um, of how that is going to work. There is also an employee retention credit. Um, so for employers, um, if, if you have a significant loss um, in gross receipts uh, due to, to COVID-19 um, or your business is suspended um, because of this, um, any wages paid after March 12th of this year through the end of the calendar year, uh, you potentially um, could take up to $10,000 per employee um, and take it as a, a credit um, on payroll taxes. I would say, um, I would like to mention the statute does say if you take advantage of this credit that you're, um, you're not able to get assistance through the PPP program. So just be aware of it. It's not that one's better or worse, but again, as, as Kevin said, these are different tools in the tool belt. So um, they're not gonna let you do both. Also, um, as we talked about, there were tax credits under the FFCRA. Um, as you would expect, there's no double dipping here. So um, just be aware of if, if we're taking tax credits under one of the provisions, then all of that's gonna be excluded from this one. So you, you may, you know, you can't, you can't take it twice, but I mean, that, kind of goes without saying. Um, there's also a delay in, in payment of payroll taxes. Th this one um, is potentially very, uh, very taxpayer friendly. Um, again, similar to the retention credits, if you do participate in this, um, you're not allowed to be, um, be, be receiving assistance through the PPP program. Um, Again, I'm hoping for a little more clarity on how this is to work. If you actually read the statute, it says that you can defer the employer portion of the FICA tax or the Social Security tax, which is 6.2%. Um, the way that would work is you would not pay that tax um, for the rest of calendar 2020. Um, and it would be due, 50% of it would be due in December of 2021, and 50% of it would be due December of 2022. So um, you're not really getting rid of the expense. Um, it's just being significantly deferred, um, all, you know, to almost two and a half years for, for a portion of it. Um, they've changed a couple of things on, on loss limitations. So for those of you who remember the TCJA back at the end of 17, um, restricted how NOLs worked, uh, net operating losses. Um, you know, for individuals and corporations, um, and you could no longer carry them back, and the ones that carried forward could only offset 80% of taxable income in a given year. Uh, the CARES Act has changed that. So now if you had an NOL, um, even in 2018, last year's return that you filed, or 2019 or 2020, you can carry them back for five years and get a refund of uh, prior taxes. Um, also, the 80% limitation on the NOL is no longer in place. So when it carries forward for the next couple of years, um, you can offset 100% of taxable income instead of that 80% limitation. Um, other than that, the, the carry forward, the indefinite carry forward from the TCGA is still in place. There was also an excess business loss limitation. Um, didn't hit a lot of people, but it, it did hit a few. Um, it was <clears throat> uh, for passive losses, um, you could only take uh, a $500,000 loss uh, for married joint, 250 for single. Um, and then that loss sort of turned into an NOL and was carried forward to future years. That is basically gone for 2018, 19, and 20. Um, so if you are limited by this, you, you may wanna talk to, uh, to your tax professional about potentially amending your return um, and, and getting a refund. Uh, retirement account benefits. Um, as many of you are aware, if, if I have a retirement account and I want to take money out of it before I'm 59 and a half, um, 
Number one, I have to pay income tax on it. Number two, I have to pay a 10% penalty and unless um, there are certain narrow exceptions um, that, that are in the statute. And then number three, they usually withhold 20% um, towards those taxes. Under the CARES Act, um, if you are a qualified individual, which we're gonna talk about here on the next slide, um, you can take a um, distribution from your retirement account of up to $100,000. And the good news is the 10% penalty um, is not applicable. Um, second thing is they're not gonna do the withholding on it to try and get as much cash in your pocket as you can right now. Um, and the third thing is even it is still subject to income tax because it's never been taxed, um, but they're gonna let you spread that over a three year period. So um, you, you've got quite a bit of deferral on having to pay the tax on that. Um, and, and you can actually pay it back um, and sort of turn it into a loan and not pay any of the income tax. It would be treated as a as sort of a rollover distribution or a loan and, and, and you could avoid the tax if you could pay it back. Um, so a qualified individual is somebody who directly has COVID-19 or whose spouse or dependent has it, but there's also this third sort of catch all that I think is almost everybody on this call probably qualifies for. It's anyone who experiences financial consequences um, as a result of this or being unable to work or having a child at home, um, reduced business. Uh, th this is really a, a pretty, pretty taxpayer friendly catch all. So um, I think most people uh, would probably be able to, to get into the qualified individual. Also related to retirement accounts, um, many of you are aware certain retirement accounts have required minimum distributions that have to be taken out. Um, just be aware some of those rules have been relaxed, um, again, allowing people a lot more flexibility in, in what they do with cash. Um, so you may not be forced to, to take those distributions if you don't want to. Um, there have been some areas of change with charitable contributions. Um, uh, there, the IR, our Congress always likes to um, encourage uh, charitable giving at times like this. So um, even if you don't itemize, um, and which is the mechanism for taking charitable deductions on your return, everyone can can have up to a three hundred dollar charitable donation. Um, it's going to be above the line, so um, that would be in addition to the standard deduction. Um, also, um, there are limitations into how much deductions you can get for charitable contributions. It's typically 50% of your adjusted gross income. Uh, that is now 100% for individuals. Uh, do be aware that some of these uh, relaxed rules don't apply to donor advised funds. There's also uh, relaxed rules for corporations. So uh, the limitation has gone from 10% up to 25. Uh, we also have some information here about um, increased provisions if you'd like to donate food inventory and sort of how that is, um, is calculated. Uh, the TCGA at the end of 17 um, had some, some um, significant restrictions on the deduction of interest, um, most notably the 163J provisions that um, at a high level, uh, limited the ability of deductibility of interest to, to 30% of, of income. That is now been, that 30% has been increased to 50% for 2019 and 2020. So that would allow for a little more interest deduction um, than we had under the old law. Do be aware that they have made a distinction. And so partnerships do not get the same benefit that um, non-partnerships get with this they're still a little more restricted um, to, to only for 2020. Um, they are allowed to use 2019 as a baseline year for determining the calc, uh, but they can't um, take this for 19, it's strictly for 20. So partnerships are a little restricted there. On, um, this was one that everybody had sort of been waiting for. Um, as you know, the TCGA had given bonus depreciation of up to 100%. Um, there was kind of a glitch when they wrote the statute. The qualified improved property um, was not listed as 15-year property. So to, to get bonus depreciation, it had to be 15-year property. Um, Treasury had even announced last year that they saw that this was an error in the statute, but Treasury is not allowed to write statute. Only Congress can do that. So their hands were a bit tied. Um, and so the CARES Act has actually 
um, has fixed this and it's actually fixed it retroactively. So um, if you were impacted or you had QIP property that you could not take 100% bonus on, you now can uh, take 100% bonus on it. It is listed as, um, as eligible property for bonus. Um, and so if that, if that impacted you on your 2018 return, um, you could go back and amend. Um, and if, or you could just file in a change in accounting method and, and carry it forward and take it um, in the current year. So I know we're up against the time here. So um, I do want to point out, uh, we're going to be sending all of these slides out to everybody uh, who was on the webinar today. Um, if you have questions, there's an email address there um, to send it to, uh, to, to sort of our SBA task force. And we'll try and get you the information as best we can. We, on our homepage, we also have um, specific information for the SBA loans. Um, also, uh, as we pointed out earlier, there are some specific provisions for nonprofits. Um, so here's Deborah's contact. She's a shareholder in our Woodlands office, uh, and she uh, specializes in nonprofits, and she is a, an excellent resource. Um, so thanks, everybody, uh, for making time today. Um, certainly hope you got some good information, and uh, we'll continue to keep you updated as best we can. Now everybody go wash your hands and cough into your elbow. Thank you.